What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back for what I'm going to describe as round one in my commentary on Dune Part 2. Just got out of seeing it in IMAX, and it was a pretty colossal experience, but I have a feeling I'm going to be talking about Dune all week. I'm going to be doing a live stream on Thursday with my buddy Bill Scurry once everybody's had a chance to go out and see it for themselves. And obviously, I'll be talking about box office, and there's, um, there's a lot of spoilers that I want to get into in more kind of granular detail, but I'm going to wait a couple days till everybody's had a chance to get up to speed and appreciate the movie for themselves because no matter what people might think of the novel and I've got the uh where the hell's my novel boom, boom, boom. oh here it is Dune right here uh the book will always remain you know perfect in my mind and like you know this like staggering epic in my heart no filmmaker could ever do a perfect job but this second movie it is the best movie of Denis Villeneuve's career. And I know whereof I speak because I recently did a video uh, basically categorizing and summing up and discussing every film in his entire filmography going back to the late 90s. And I love On Sandy and I love Sicario. And I, I'm a big fan of a lot of his movies and I really love Prisoners. Prisoners is a strong contender for, um, my, for the top slot. But I think Dune Part 2, it, it definitely is number one. Number The first Dune blew my mind and knocked my socks off, but I would never criticize anybody or debate with anybody who says, you know what? I saw Dune and I fell asleep. And to be fair, the person next to me during Dune part two, I knew they were bored out of their mind because they kept kind of like messing with their cup and like playing with the ice. And like, I could just tell they were very distracted. If you're more, if you're more interested by the ice cubes in your cup than in the movie, well then maybe something's wrong with you or maybe just Denny Villeneuve and Frank Herbert's Dune are not necessarily the thing for you. But for me, this movie scratched a lot of itches simultaneously. As a fan of just giant epic spectacle going back to the earliest days of movies up to the present day, every once in a while certain visionaries will come along who know how to do a proper epic. And you might talk about like Anthony Mann and movies like El Cid or Francis Ford Coppola and Apocalypse Now or David Lean and friggin' Bridge on the River Kwai or uh, Lawrence of Arabia. I mean, every once in a while these visionaries come along or to use a, a present day um, reference, Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan knows how to do an epic. Dunkirk was a full blown fucking epic. And it's funny seeing how Denis Villeneuve and Christopher Nolan have become kind of like buddies and rivals where every time one of them does something well, it encourages the other to reach for greater heights. And you desperately need that in any creative endeavor. You need rivals that you're trying to impress, but you secretly want them to be kind of jealous of your work. And it's interesting how they both like to experiment with black and white and so on and so forth. And they both love science fiction. Science fiction has been great to both of them. But much how Paul Atreides has to kind of level up to achieve his destiny through his Mentat disciplines and his swordsmanship disciplines and his Bene Gesserit disciplines, all the various fields of endeavor where he's been kind of getting tutored his entire life, but he's slowly but surely kind of evolving and becoming something that the, the world and the universe has never seen before. I feel like uh, Denny Villeneuve's entire career has been leading up to this point where he really shows us what he can do because while it is this huge, sweeping, warlike epic with all the spectacle and just like just gorgeous, eye popping visuals you could ever imagine. I mean, the trailer does a very good job of capturing some of the battles and just like the look and the design on Giddy Prime and the look and the design of the Emperor's ship and that sort of thing. But the movie never forgets to pause and slow down and savor the little moments, the little beats, the, the human relationships between Paul and all of his new friends and family members within the Fremen. Like the first third of the movie, actually I won't even specify, the earlier part of the movie is all about Paul learning the ways of the Fremen. And that feels the most intimate and the movie kind of <sighs> slows down takes a breath and just lets you live in that world. That for me was actually the most remarkable achievement of the movie because when there's so much material in this book that any filmmaker is gonna to wanna to try to like shove into the overall experience. There's so much detail and so many characters and so many great scenes. And if you try to put everything in, well, the movie would just kind of rupture and come apart at the seams. You, you honestly need like 30 hours instead of like two giant three hour movies. But I mean, there's tons of good stuff from the book that is missing. And a few things that he's changed, but these are creative changes and artistic decisions that we can debate. It's, they're not going to be like cultural wedge issues. Like one of the most loathsome aspects of modern day film discourse is that it all just feels like political partisanship and it's annoying as fucking hell. It's like, let's get back to the appreciation of the art and entertainment of the movie business. Like, let's get back to the joy and the exhilaration we feel when we're watching these movies because I have a very simple test for movies that I've been using since I was a little kid. 
and I didn't really articulate it until later, but no matter how many great movies you've seen, no matter how much great like film history you've read or film analysis you've read, no matter how like enriched and sophisticated your palette for storytelling might be, in the end, what we're hoping for with movies is a heightened sense of emotional experience where like for me at least when it when it happens i get chills up my neck i get chills down my arms and then under the best of circumstances like with like return of the king with the arrival of like the riders of rohan i will get teary-eyed like that's what we're hoping and praying for and in the end like everything else you can kind of throw out all the other analysis like did the movie have an emotional impact and the answer is yes i felt chills multiple times like in the first 30 minutes and it was just such a relief to have that experience because leading up to this, I just kept thinking in my mind, like, what are all the things that can go horribly wrong? Like, I could be surrounded by a bunch of knuckleheads who are on their phones the whole time, or the theater could crash and burn. I was so paranoid about getting in tonight. I had um, different tickets at a different theater in IMAX just in case, like, some theater suddenly announced in the last hour, like, oh, sorry, we, like, you know, we lost power for the evening, blah, blah, blah. Like, I, I had plans within plans, as they say in Frank Herbert's novel. And I even had backup tickets for Thursday, so plans within plans within plans, but um, I'll probably let those, uh, actually, no, maybe I'll just go back and savor it on Thursday one more time because there's a lot to take in, there's a lot of detail, but in the end, it's the sweep, it's the exhilaration that I responded to the most. When you're watching Fremen riding along in those goddamn worms, like the way David Lynch staged it, it's very different where like the worms are like up on the surface of the sand and you got like all that crazy electric guitar wailing and it's it's fucking awesome like David Lynch nailed that stuff but Denis Villeneuve went in a completely different direction where what it reminded me of more was like hanging out like if you could find a way to combine surfing with combat that's what it feels like instead of like the ocean it's sand and instead of surfboards it's these giant fucking worms but when they're riding along you really feel the speed and how they're, they're leaning into it and like they're hanging on for dear life. It's so fucking cool. And in the end, if you're making a big, giant war, spectacle, epic, saga, blah, 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 whatever words you want to use, in the end, you have to deliver have to de deliver the goods. Like, are you packing the gear? And yes, this movie is packing the gear. And because this movie's a little long, I had to sneak off to the bathroom once or twice, but there was this hysterical situation I encountered one time. I ran in there. I was basically trying to like make like a mad dash and run back. But as I approached the urinal, these two guys were having an angry debate about Citizen Kane versus Dune Part 2. And I just kind of laughed in my breath. I was like, are, are, am I missing like some giant conversation about Citizen Kane in the men's room? And one guy kind of like stormed off in a huff. He's like, no one's going to think about Citizen Kane, blah, blah, blah. I was like, you know, whatever it takes to get you through the night, just enjoy the show. The way I, I measure the influence of classic movies or classic directors is how many careers they inspire. It's one way to do it. Like in the late 60s and early 70s, there were a lot of filmmakers who said they got into filmmaking because of Citizen Kane. So yeah, Citizen Kane launched a lot of careers, and I fucking love Citizen Kane. Orson Welles is my favorite filmmaker. So if in 20, 30 years' time, we have a whole new generation of brilliant, visionary sci-fi directors who say, I saw Dune and Dune Part Two in the theater as a little boy, changed my life, and for the rest of my life, I've been writing and reading and like crafting, like working on all my skills to deliver that kind of seismic sci-fi experience for the adoring public. Like, that's when we'll know what kind of influence Denny Villeneuve's had. Like In terms of box office, I think there's a very real chance that this movie's going to blow the doors off Dune Part 1, because Dune Part 1, while it was cool and it had great tone and style and it was introducing all these great characters, wasn't necessarily the world's greatest, like, action movie. Like all those scenes with Duncan Idaho, I thought were kind of sloppily staged and they kind of threw out the whole shield mechanic pretty uh, pretty early on in all those fight scenes. So while I love that first movie, I didn't feel like it truly del delivered the goods when it comes to combat. But luckily, the great Austin Butler, my, uh, my inbred half cousin, you know, stepbrother from another mother, he's awesome in this. And I feel like no matter what genre you're playing in, whether it's a traditional action or fantasy or whatever, if your villains aren't cool as shit, well, then your heroes have nothing to kind of measure themselves against and your whole movie falls to pieces. And luckily, Stellan Skarsgård is good, returning as Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, but Austin Butler is incredible as uh, Fade Rautha. And I was joking as I walked into the theater, like, in that Hollywood loves to change all the source material of all the projects that they work on these days. I was like, what if the Harkonnens are Harkonnens, as they pronounce it in Denis Villeneuve's world? I've been pronouncing it Harkonnen since it's all the David Lynch in the theater back in 1984. But what if Hollywood decided to throw out the book and say, you know what? Fuck it. The Harkonnens win this time around. I was obviously being half serious. But it is really frustrating at times seeing how this entire motion picture industry 
really struggles with trying to figure out how do we take cool books, cool comics, cool games and adapt them to the screen without making the existing fans want to fucking, you know, reach for a big ass blade <laughs> and start hacking people to pieces. And Denny Villeneuve is one of the few filmmakers alive where I will trust him to adapt anything. Most filmmakers, I don't have that kind of confidence. Christopher Nolan, no matter what books he wants to adapt, like more power to you, go to it. Like I've got all the all the confidence in you, all the confidence in the world in you. And the same holds true for Denis Villeneuve. And I know he keeps talking about wanting to do more books in the saga. We've got uh, Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, and God Emperor of Dune. I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea because I think the most commercial of all the books is the first one because it's just such a great premise where you've got this this family that gets betrayed by the emperor and then he basically goes into like guerrilla warfare mode builds himself back up gets revenge for his father and it's just a, a glorious story as well as a really powerful cautionary tale about power and what it does to you i mean power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely as the old expression goes and a big part of the story is seeing how paul evolves in dune messiah and also obviously uh, without giving away any spoilers from Children of Dune and God Emperor of Dune, but as you can tell from the cover of God Emperor of Dune, it goes into some very strange places. That's not a statue on the cover. <laughs> That's, um, well, I'm not going to go any further. Read the books and you'll find out everything that uh, you want to know, but it goes, I think the, the franchise gets increasingly niche where it's like true diehard sci-fi freaks really enjoy the series. I don't know, but who knows? Maybe like the audience now, has been conditioned to kind of go along for the ride. And even if they don't completely, totally, even if they don't like feel completely on board with everything that the series has to offer, maybe after seeing Dune Part 2, they'd be willing to um, you know, trust Denis Villeneuve with whatever he wishes to do with the subsequent books. Because if you're going to do Dune Messiah, you can't stop there. Dune Messiah doesn't necessarily provide the most satisfying conclusion. If he wanted to combine Dune Messiah and Children of Dune, that would have a more of a feeling of resolution, but I don't, th I don't think Dune Messiah would be a satisfying conclusion, but I'm getting sidetracked with hypotheticals. Let's focus on the movie that we have because I have a feeling people are going to be discussing and debating this movie for the rest of the year because I don't think there's a single giant blockbuster on the calendar that's going to be able to hold a candle to it. I don't know if this movie is going to make $400 million like the first one or a billion. I mean, I would love, I would love to see this movie do extremely well. It's been a very long time since we had a movie that ha gives you those feelings like Peter Jackson's Return of the King. Like, Return of the King, I saw it six times in the theater and cried like a baby M most of those screenings. And I had tons of complaints. I think, actually, for me, Return of the King is the most uneven of the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, but the peaks are so good that I kind of ignore all my complaints about how Peter Jackson handled that book. And I have a similar relationship now with Dune Part Two, where I... How can I say this politely? I strongly object to one major creative decision that he makes toward the end of the movie, but I get it. This is Denny Villeneuve's interpretation. This is his this is him this is him trying to channel the experience of Dune through his own lens. And if he's not remotely interested in the Mentats, I mean I, I get the feeling that like Denny Villeneuve must not like math at all or computers at all because the first movie totally gave the shaft to Mentats and this second movie completely, totally disregards them. And for me, you can't understand what's happening to Paul inside of his brain unless you understand that he's basically been getting groomed and trained to be a living computer. And when you combine that with the psychoactive properties of the spice melange, that's part of what makes his brain get you know start to expand so rapidly. In addition to his uh, Bene Gesserit tra training, which allows him to, you know, well, I don't want to go into plot details yet. So anyway. Zip it on uh, what happens to him in, in regards to the Bene Gesserit. But what I haven't seen in a big Hollywood movie in a long time is a hero who feels and looks and acts like a complete and total bad motherfucker. And there are a few scenes in this movie. You can see them in the trailer out of context, but they make, they're make they much more powerful in context. Where Paul would just be walking through a crowd of adoring followers and or striding into battle against the Harkonnens or the Sardaukar where just the costume design and his posture, like between the hood and the mask and like the nose plugs and just everything about his look and his posture, walking into battle, pulling out blades, like Jesus Christ, like can Paul just win this entire war all by himself? And what's cool about him is how he just wants to be one of many. And he's like, yeah, and if I fall, y'all will keep going. Like the way he's able to 
befriend and earn the trust of the Fremen early on because early on they are very hostile they are very um, let's just say they are, they're very suspicious but when it comes to the look of Paul and the way he carries himself and just his posture and his bearing it reminded me a lot of the original art by John Shanher or Shonher I, I never quite know how to pronounce his name but he was one of the original artists who was brought in to illustrate Dune like the covers as well as like a few chapter headings and that sort of thing and still to this day he's the best artist ever to take a crack at the at the the world of Dune and the major story beats, like you really can't beat them. But as I was watching this, I was like, you know what? I bet somewhere, somehow, Denny Villeneuve had a look at a few of those drawings and did his best to try to channel some of those influences into the films. But it's through Stilgar, where slow, Stilgar as well as Chani, where slowly but surely, like the world starts to open its open its doors to him. Uh, God, there's so much I want to get to. I mentioned Stilgar, so let me just add a comment. Stilgar is amazing in this and made me laugh many times. However, one of my complaints about this overall franchise, as depicted by Denis Villeneuve, we very rarely get to see Stilgar, like the friend, Stilgar, the leader. We, we more, more often than not, in the context of Denis Villeneuve, see Stilgar, the believer, the fundamentalist who really believes all these prophecies that have been deliberately planted and kind of seeded by the Bene Gesserit for generations because they're speaking of plans within plans. Their plans date back centuries as they're manipulating cultures, manipulating gene pools, all trying to create the conditions that will allow the Kwisatz Haderach to appear. But I can live with the limited perspective on Stilgar just because Javier Bardem was just so I won't say he's so fucking funny. It's going to make it sound like he's telling jokes. He's funny because you'll just be in love with him and you'll adore him. And he'll say things where it's like he's so likable. You'll find yourself laughing just because of like he is such a complete and total believer in what uh, Moab Deeb might be able to do for the Fremen. But let me get back to Austin Butler and the idea of villains. Like the depiction of Gidi Prime and that arena and the architecture and the black armor. It's one of those things where whether you're talking about Jodorowsky's Dune and the original drawings by H.R. Giger or the way they were depicted by David Lynch or the way they're described in Frank Herbert's Dune, the Harkonnens need to be the most evil people imaginable. And I would say this movie for a PG-13 mainstream piece of like studio entertainment gets as close to true evil as you're going to see in a big budget mainstream movie. And it's hilarious listening to Austin Butler and the way he reads his lines in this because part of him makes it sound like he's still doing Elvis or uh, Masters of the Air where he's kind of doing that, that laid back, you know, Mr. No Big Deal, yada, yada, yada. But every once in a while you can tell that the, uh, the nephew of, the Baron Harkon of Baron Harkonnen is very much trying to emulate and uh, imitate the mannerisms and the, the way of speaking that his uncle has. And so every once in a while when he's like barking orders, it's like, what? like there were times I was like, wait a second, was that Austin Butler speaking or was that still on Skarsgård? But that stuff was really cool. And so, yeah, I, I could not have been more thrilled with the depiction of the Harkonnens. The only way I would have been, been more, more happy would be, and I'll mention this in my spoiler section, there's one possible future that Paul envisions at one point, which this movie ignores. I mean, it's like a, a paragraph in the book, but it's, it's my favorite paragraph in the entire book. And I know that's a bold statement, but more on that in a sec when we get to the spoiler section. But we have a few more additions to the cast. I love seeing uh, Leia Seydoux popping up as Lady Fenring. My, um, my joy at her performance was tainted by the absence of Count Fenring. But let me talk about Count Fenring in the spoiler section. But we also had the arrival of Florence Pugh and Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken, I mean, he's not necessarily trying to talk like the Emperor of the Known Universe. He's just talking like Christopher Walken. I'm like, I guess the New York culture is alive and well 8,000 years from now. But Florence P was great because her character in the novel, most of the chapters begin with a, a, a section from, uh, hang on, see, it's it from like, is she reading from Moab Deeb's journals? But yeah, it's from the manual of Moab Deeb by the princess Irulan or Irulan, however you choose to pronounce it. But nearly every single chapter in the book begins with an excerpt from his book as she's kind of trying to help you understand what's going on in this world. She's almost like a Greek chorus in that sense. And the movie does a really cool job of allowing Florence Pugh to re provide a similar role with this movie, kind of introducing certain sections and just providing some of the exposition that the audience needs if they're not familiar with the novel. And, and also, she's just cute as hell in that outfit. Like, this coming Halloween, there are going to be a lot of people who have a lot of fun doing Dune-themed Dune attire, whether it's some of the royal family or the Fremen or the Harkonnens. I mean, there's a, there's a lot to play with. I think the best costume awards have to go to Florence Pugh, uh, Timothy Chalamet, 
and Austin Butler. Those would be my three favorite outfits. So who knows? Maybe if I, uh, I'll invest a little cash and do some Fade Routha cosplay this coming Halloween season. Now, I could easily talk about Dune the rest of the goddamn night, but let me just close my non-spoiler section with, it's such a relief to have a great movie-going experience. If you're a movie lover of any age from any era, what you crave are those increasingly rare experiences where you just get to sit back and just have the magic of movies completely envelop you, envelop your peripheral vision and just suck you into another world, take you on a journey that where at the end of that journey, you might not be the same person as you were at the beginning of the journey. And it's this is the journey that I think people, myself included, are going to take many times. I think I saw Dune Part 1 four times. I'm going to blow the doors off that with this one. This one I'm going to see many, many times. And that's just so much goddamn fun. So even at age 47, knocking at the door of 48, am I 40? Yeah, I'm getting old enough now where I'm like, how old am I? Yeah, I'm turning 48 this summer. It's just a relief to know that my cold, dead heart still has the capacity to experience true pop culture euphoria and joy and exhilaration. And this movie absolutely provided it. But let's get into a few spoilers because I can't offer... Uh, my, 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 I guess my most wounding critiques without getting into some specifics. So if you've not yet seen the movie, bail out now, and I'll be back on Thursday with um, a big, giant, comprehensive uh, live stream talking about all the ins and outs of the flick. But for now, spoilers, last warning, three, two, one. So I already mentioned the complete and total absence of uh, Mentats in this film, which I think is a huge mistake because in the context of the book, Thufir Hawat has a major role to play in, well, throughout the entire book, he should have been a major character in the second movie. Why he wasn't there, I'm just like, missed opportunity. I get you have a finite amount of screen time, but leaving Thufirhawa out, colossal mistake. And obviously, Piter, he died in the, in the first movie, so you can't bring him back. But I really felt like the, movie, the first movie really dropped the ball when it came to describing their capabilities and what they bring to the table and how there's nothing more terrifying than the idea of a Mentat assassin, somebody who's basically a walking, talking, living computer who kills people for a living which brings you around to Count Fenring, a minor character in the book, but he is what Fade Rautha and Paul Atreides are both like, kind of like, they, they are the, they represent like centuries of genetic ma manipulation by the Bene Gesserit where they're trying to create this potentially like super being who can like, who can be everywhere at all, uh, uh, be everywhere at once and see all things and see all possible outcomes. Count Fenring was the closest they came beforehand, but he was born a eunuch. He was sterile. And so um, his relationship with Lady Fenring is really interesting because she's a Bene Gesserit. He's an assassin for the emperor and like the emperor's closest friend. Leaving him out was a mistake. But once again, this movie left out everything related to Mentat. So that's a, a major complaint. But my biggest complaint by far is the decision of what to do with Saint Alia of the Knife. Some people call her Alia, some people call her Alia, but Paul's younger sister, Alia Atreides, who's just fascinating because, um, once again, this is spoilers, but we, we, are, we are aware of the fact that Jessica's pregnant with her in the first movie, but what changes Alia so dramatically is when her mother drinks the water of life while pregnant. When you drink the water of life, your brain is flooded with all the memories and experiences and accumulated wisdom as well as trauma of all the Bene Gesserit witches that came before you. So you get centuries of wisdom and strategy, but also like inner horror all at once. And it's fatal to men. And the women who survive become Bene Gesserit, become reverend mothers. But because Ali is still in the womb, she becomes a reverend mother then and there. So she's flooded with all this knowledge and all this expertise while she's still an infant. And once she's born, she becomes an, like, she's regarded as an abomination because she walks and talks like an adult in spite of the fact that she's a little girl. And I get it, the creative riddle of how do you do a toddler who walks and talks like a reverend mother who in the book kills Baron Harkonnen I was like, I get that that's a problem where, you know, a lot of people laugh at, at Alia in the, in the David Lynch film. You know, How can this be? I mean, it's, it's very easy to imitate her and laugh at her. And so in my mind, when you're reading it, she makes perfect sense. And she's so cool and so hardcore and so lethal and just like finishing off wounded. Like when the, at the big battle of Arakeen at the end, she's running around like finishing off bodies like young little Fremen girls are taught to do, uh, you know, from a very young age. But more importantly, she plays a huge role in Dune Messiah. And when I saw that uh, Anya Taylor Joy was cast as Ali, I was like, "Fuck yeah!" Like maybe they'll like shrink her down and make her like a little digital version, or maybe she'll just do the voice. Like, how are they going to do this? But Ali is never born in the movie, and Paul ends up kill killing Baron Harkonnen, which is it's fine, but it's just very different. It's something very satisfying about a little girl like gesturing for the Baron to come in and killing him with the Gamjabar, you know, the thing that's, well, that's been threatening. Um, Paul when he puts his hand in the box 
in the first movie. I just love that. And there's just something just eerie and creepy about a little girl who speaks like an adult, who says things that make all the adults kind of like run for cover around her, leaving that character out of the movie. I think it's a giant missed opportunity, but I get that it basically would be almost impossible to achieve the desired result without opening yourself up to a lot of ridicule. That said, Denis Villeneuve decided to incorporate her into the plot by allowing her to communicate with her mother. And basically, you'll have situations where Paul and Jessica are having a conversation, and Ali is making little contributions through her mother. And that's it's interesting. It's cool. You can see the relationship. But I just, I fucking love Saint Ali of the Knife. I think she's an incredible character. So it's a criticism, but it by no means breaks or ruins the movie. Like, there's certain movies where there are certain creative decisions where, like, I'm sorry, but like you went so off the rails that I can't even forgive you, and like you've lost me. Never at any point did this movie lose me. It, it was it held me in the palm of its hand every step of the way. I was totally invested, totally enthralled. But if I could see the perfect Dune movie as I would want to see it, well, just it would be Dune as written. But the good news is I can always read it. It's always there, waiting for me anytime I want to revisit Dune and its uh, and all of its various perfections. But my last little nitpicky grievance is the absence of one crucial scene as Paul's powers and skills start to expand and he starts to see possible outcomes, more likely outcomes, like his prescience is on the rise. There's one outcome which is just so grim and so evil and I always thought it was fascinating because obviously Paul is wrestling with, is he a liberator? Or is he a tyrant? Or is he going to be a, a bit of the two? And he foresees one possible outcome. I mean, obviously there's possible fa famine, and uh, universal genocide and jihad and holy wars and all these things that he's he's like he's walking the edge of a of a of the blade of a knife trying to succeed in his goals of taking over doom while at the same time not like you know launching the whole world into this giant bloody horrible civil war but one of the possible outcomes that he's foreseen is that he will approach Baron Harkonnen and lovingly refer to him as grandfather. And neither Jeth and Jessica didn't even know she was the daughter of Baron, Vla Baron Vladimir Harkonnen until she drank the water of life. Paul figures it out when he drinks the water of life. But I always thought it was just so cool and so eerie to see how even Paul recognizes that there is a way where he would be kind of reconciled with the Harkonnens and more dangerous and more terrifying than ever before. So that was missing, but I get it. But I, I don't know why that paragraph has always had such a, a huge impact on me, but as you read it, it's just bone chilling. So let's talk what the future might hold. Uh, the tracking on this movie is a little up in the air. Some people are predicting as low as 60 and some people are predicting as high as 80. I think once the word of mouth gets out there, you'll start seeing the tracking starting to go up. But this is not Marvel, at least this is not Marvel circa... 2018 or 2019 where it's just like an automatic like slam dunk where you're going to open up to 150 million dollars and that sort of thing i think warner brothers would be thrilled with anything around 75 or 80 but i'm going to go balls deep and just say that the movie's so good and the execution is so exhilarating and so so exciting that there's a very good chance this movie might open north of 100 million and you know, so, I mean, we're not making we're, nothing's on the line. So it's like I, all, all I lose is my pride if I'm wrong. But I'm gonna choose to be the optimist. It's so rare that we see a good movie. I mean, think almost the last great big budget action sci-fi like adventure movie that you saw on the big screen. I mean, Guardians Volume Three, but like Dune Part Two is way better than Guardians Volume Three. I think Dune Part Two is better than any major blockbuster released last year, except for maybe Oppenheimer, which obviously is offering a very different experience from, uh, from Dune Part Two. But I would love to see Denny Villeneuve get the opportunity to continue to make movies set in this world. What I don't want to see, though, like imagine if this movie makes a billion dollars and Denny Villeneuve's like, you know what? I think I've had my fun, but I'm moving on to other projects. Well, then Warner Brothers will have no choice but to go out and find some hack who doesn't know their ass from their elbow to continue the franchise. Like, like, unless it's going to be like Christopher Nolan or, hell, David Lynch, he's still alive. Let, let him come back and do Dune Messiah. But I would be so cautious and so nervous about anybody other than Denis Villeneuve making more movies set in this world. But if it's extremely successful, we all know how showbiz works. If something works and it, does, like, and it makes piles of money, there will be spinoffs and sequels and remakes until the end of time, until they've completely destroyed the reputation, destroyed the brand for all time, basically sowed the sea fields with salt to the point where no one, no one will ever want to discuss Dune ever again. I don't want that to happen, but it could end up being the victim of its own success if it does extremely well. So I want the movie to do extremely well, 
but not so well where that for the next 20 years, we get nothing but like subpar, shitty Dune spinoffs and that sort of thing. Unless they're adapting the books of Frank Herbert, I'm not interested. And let me revise that. Unless they're adapting the books of Frank Herbert with integrity and taste and intelligence and vision, like the idea of a filmmaker expressing themselves visually and being uh, faithful to the source material. Those are not mutually exclusive options. Like Peter Jackson proved with the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you can express your sensibility and your style while at the same time trying to filter somebody else's story through your own vision. It is possible, but not, not every filmmaker packs the gear or has the talent or the vision to pull that off. Denny Villeneuve definitely does. So I just hope that, I guess rather than like freaking myself about all these possible horrible outcomes. I'm just going to enjoy the moment, spike the football, because it's so rare that we get a giant blockbuster-sized movie that's incredibly engaging, incredibly exhilarating, and just so satisfying to watch. I'm going to, um, I guess, all those problems that I'm worried about, we can save them for another day. Th this week's going to be devoted to just celebrating the hell out of this remarkable achievement, because this might be the best that this year has to offer. I mean, I'm still looking forward to some other stuff, but... This is going to be a, a tough one to beat in any event. I think I've said all I want to say initially. I look forward to doing more videos this week, and I look forward to discussing this movie in greater detail once the entire world has had a chance to see it, enjoy it, digest it. And if people don't like it, that's totally fine. Remember the guy sitting beside me playing with his uh, cup of ice. It's not going to be for everybody. Don't shove it down the throats like... Um, there's no such thing as like the one true opinion. Like you, people are allowed to disagree about what they like or dislike about Doom Part 2. Maybe some people will think that what was done with uh, Alia is like the coolest idea and like the perfect workaround for a creative riddle that was going to be very difficult to solve. Fine. Like, you know, people can, are all entitled to their opinions and I, I look forward to discussing all those, uh, those little changes in greater detail, but they're not that many changes. Like no one has to worry about going to see this movie and where suddenly all the major scenes and lines of dialogue that were originally belonged to Paul in the book have suddenly been given out to other characters in order to kind of raise them up. Like Paul Atreides is the star of this story. Paul Atreides is the cautionary tale. This is a story about revenge and and the potential pitfalls of power. And I think Denny Villeneuve more or less has stuck the landing. So it's been an incredible ride over the last couple of years, looking forward to and anticipating what the final product would be. And I think um, yeah, if I wanted to give it like a letter grade, you know, 9.5 out of 10 or 9.75 out of 10, it fucking rules. And I look forward to seeing it many, many more times. But I hope you enjoyed this review. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. And let's, let's all plan on talking about this in greater detail come Thursday. But if you enjoyed this video, like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell to be notified of future videos, and hunt me down on Twitter at Colbrax. But I can't thank you for watching, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.